thank you to the Montgomery History team, Matt Logan, who we just saw uh, earlier for, for having me here today. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction. I know we're here to hear about Georgetown Prep. I am excited to hear about the history uh, as well. And this is part of a broader effort that the county uh, is undertaking with Montgomery History being uh, one of the key uh, partners with uh, Remembrance and Reconciliation. We have a new Re Remembrance and Re Reconciliation Commission that uh, was passed in uh, March of 2020. Um, that has uh, been supported by um, a, a deep dive into the history of Montgomery County with uh, efforts like these being an important uh, part of it. One of the key areas of uh, that effort is to explore uh, the uh, unfortunate, uncomfortable uh, history of lynchings in Montgomery County. We have three documented lynchings uh, in Montgomery County, three of them. Uh, um, uh, two of them uh, were actually uh, from the place where I go to office every day, uh, or certainly during uh, normal times, not during COVID, uh, but the county council office building is now where the old Rockville uh, courthouse used to be, and two of the documented lynchings uh, took place from that uh, courthouse. So uh, efforts uh, like these uh, to take a deep dive into the uncomfortable parts of our past are just such an important part of uh, recognizing how we got here and part of the reconciliation process that we so uh, desperately uh, need. And uh, we're also uh, trying to do what we can um, uh, dealing with uh, renamings of streets and other uh, aspects uh, in, in the county just around the corner from Georgetown Prep. In fact, are three straight streets named after Confederate uh, generals uh, that are in the process of being uh, renamed the Jeb Stewart Court, Jeb Stewart Road, um, uh, and Jubal Early uh, Court, just just down the street uh, from, uh, from 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 Georgetown uh, Prep. So uh, it's really important that we have these uh, types of exercises that we continue to uh, focus on uh, these really challenging, really uncomfortable parts of our past. And I'm really pleased that we have somebody with the expertise of Dr. Oaks uh, to join us here and to provide uh, this uh, deep dive into. Uh, the history of uh, Georgetown Prep, one of the uh, uh, oldest and uh, most storied Jesuit Catholic high schools uh, in the country. And uh, with that, um, uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Oakes, uh, who has received his PhD in history from the University of Maryland. Uh, go Terps, I am an alma mater of University of Maryland as well. Uh, Dr. Oakes has taught AP US history for 43 years at Georgetown Prep, uh, where he holds the Lawler Family Chair of History. We are so pleased to have Dr. Oaks teaching our young people in our community and uh, even more pleased that he's here with us today. And so with that, uh, please take it over Dr. Oaks. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be with you this afternoon to discuss the role that slavery played in the history of Georgetown Prep, a Jesuit high school that is the oldest Catholic boys high school established in the United States. The title of this talk is a slightly modified version of the title uh, of an exhibit that marked the end of what was uh, denoted as uh, a year of reconciliation, the 2017-2018 uh, school year at uh, Georgetown Prep. During this year, the entire school community focused on the school's historical connection with slavery. The exhibit is used each year since as part of PREP's continuing commitment to educate its students, especially uh, entering freshmen and transfer students and parents and alumni about the pivotal role that slavery played in PREP's history and what that means uh, for the school's mission today. The painting in this slide, which was done by then senior Xian Chang Yao from Taiwan, graced the entrance of the exhibit that was uh, the culmination of that year of reconciliation. And it graced the entrance to the exhibit. You can see uh, a Tony here. At uh, Georgetown Prep, uh, we uh, began this uh, deep dive into this, the schools history uh, on slavery 
Uh, and, uh, and this was a, a result of the fact that Georgetown Prep uh, was so, uh, so much involved uh, in that history. And it might seem strange because of course, the, the things that have appeared in the newspaper, et cetera, usually focus on Georgetown University. Uh, and, um, and so it's, it's important to uh, explain to you uh, why it was that this story is uh, so important uh, to, to our uh, school and, and, and why we, we looked at it. Um, just a little background, officially, the Jesuits, officially known as the Society of Jesus, is a religious order of men founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in 1534. Uh, the first Jesuit school, uh, uh, college, it, they were always termed colleges, was opened in Messina, Sicily in 1548. And subsequently, the Jesuits became known as uh, preeminent educators of young men. Now, currently in the United States, there are 28 Jesuit colleges and universities and 62 high schools. From 1789 until 1927, Georgetown Prep was part of Georgetown College. In the 1919-1920 academic year, the school moved to its present location on Rockville Pike, and last year celebrated 100 years at its current location just west of Garrett Park. Prep's connection with Georgetown University between 1789 and 1864, when the last enslaved people held by the Maryland Jesuits were freed, has made the topic of Jesuit slaveholding so immediate to our school. And uh, as I will make clear again um, during the body of my talk, Georgetown College between 1789 and 1880 was primarily a prep school with some college men. The preparatory department was the largest department in the school. The graduating class of the college seniors in 1869, for example, just numbered six. If you look at the illustrations on, on your screen, uh, you can see a, a, a couple of things that I'd like to point out here. Uh, the 1867 photo uh, shows uh, two, two buildings. One, the very first uh, building on, on the Georgetown campus, uh, completed in 1792. And then or next to it, the first building uh, completely dedicated to the prep students, and that was in 1855. Uh, that's McGuire Hall, it's still standing. Uh, this is uh, the, the college class of 1869. There are six uh, guys in it, uh, that's all. Uh, the, and here's a, a picture of uh, some of the prep students uh, at, uh, at the college. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see that you know, these, are, these are all teenagers. And this is, the, um, this is Boland Hall, the central part of Boland Hall, which is uh, the first building uh, constructed on our campus, on our, on our, present, uh, on our present campus. Uh, excuse me. The story of Jesuit slaveholding in Maryland and other states such as uh, Missouri and Louisiana is a story that has been investigated in detail over the years by historians, primarily Jesuits, but also laypersons. But it gained national attention beginning in 2015 when students at Georgetown University protested the names of two buildings on campus that bore the names Mullady and McSherry. Uh, the two men who had engineered the sale of 272 slaves from the Maryland Jesuit plantations to Louisiana. Some of the proceeds of that sale rescued Georgetown College from impending financial ruin and thus rescued the preparatory department. Students at GU were stirred to action after having read a series of articles first published in 2014 in the Hoya newspaper by Georgetown junior Matthew Quaylen, a history major, uh, he drew on previous Jesuit scholarship in relating the known but largely forgotten story of the sale. And he urged the administration to strip the two names, Milady and McSherry, from the buildings, something that was done in 2015. The story of the 272 and efforts at Georgetown to deal with the issue captured the attention of Rachel Swarns of the New York Times, whose articles brought the story uh, to, the, uh, to, to national attention. Okay. Now here you can see uh, on the, uh, in the slide here, you can see the, um, excuse me, let me just do that. Great. The slides you can see, uh, the areas that we're going to be dealing with in this story. Uh, here's Georgetown College. Uh, here are the Jesuit farms, St. Inigo's, Newtown, St. Thomas, all along the Potomac River, right? And then White Marsh up here in, in present day uh, Bowie. Okay, now what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show, share with you 
uh, what we did at school, uh, part of the uh, uh, part of a program that we had. Um, it, it consisted of four talks. Uh, two of them involved myself and two students narrating and splitting the story that I'm going to read to you. Uh, then Rachel Swarns came to talk to the student body, and then a descendant, uh, Melly Short Cologne, who then was a 63-year-old uh, uh, first-year student at Georgetown. She'll graduate this year. She is now the current head of the uh, 272 Descendants Organization. So I'm going to go into the mode, and I'm going to actually use the language uh, that uh, that you know is directed towards our guys. And you can see the techniques that we tried to use in terms of of trying to help them. Uh, identify with the young uh, the young guys uh, who were enslaved at uh, on the plantations and who were uh, sold. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to go uh, to uh, that. Yeah, I'll just put that up there. Great. I'm going to go uh, to that right now. Okay. Uh, the, the councilman uh, was talking about reconciliation, and so uh, we we made it a very uh, a we were very determined to put forth for the kids a, a very clear definition of what reconciliation means and, and, and its key elements. Um, so reconciliation means the healing of divisions between individuals and or groups. It requires three elements, recognition that a grievance or grievances have been committed, repentance and expressions of sorrow and apology for the grievance, a concrete action to atone for the, those grievances. Uh, and, and we have this, 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 this phrase from a document from the, from the Society of Jesus, the formal name of the Jesuits, right? To reconcile, we must enter into a deeper understanding of the mystery of evil in the world and the transforming power of a love that seeks justice. With special focus, uh, excuse me, so I'd like to begin the presentation that we gave to the guys. A roll call. Basil and Cornelius Neely Hawkins, 13. Robert, Sam, David Queen, 14. Austin, 15. Tom, Abraham, and Tom, 16. Remus, 17. Anderson, Isaac, and William. Uh, Anderson, Isaac, sorry, and William. 18. The names of the teenagers just noted appeared in a census of two, 272 enslaved persons in 1838, living on four farms owned by the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus, a religious order founded by St. Ignatius and renowned for its schools. Today, each of them might very well be a prep student, enjoying all the opportunities that the school provides but that path was not open to them in the 1830s. For they and approximately 300 other men, women, and children were ensnared in slavery, the South's peculiar institution. Slavery existed not only on the farms, but also in the institutions owned and operated by the Maryland Jesuits. These institutions included Georgetown College, of which the preparatory department was the largest component. Indeed, in 1838, the year of the sale of 272 slaves, approximately 75% of the 154 students on campus were preparatory students. We would ask you today to use a key method of Ignatian reflection, that of imaginatively placing yourself in the scenes that will unfold. We ask you to try to walk in the shoes of those young men, ages 13 through 18, who could so easily be sitting next to you today as one of your prep brothers, but whose fate was very different in the 1830s. They would never have the opportunity for an education, but they and their families and the rest of the enslaved persons on the Jesuit farms would save Georgetown College and Georgetown Prep. Their labor and that of their forebears had been essential to the school's founding in 1789. An organizational meeting that year designated that the salary of the principal would be paid from the income of two of the Jesuit farms. Income earned through the sale of tobacco 
raised by the slaves. They and the other enslaved persons on the four Jesuit Maryland farms of White Marsh, St. Thomas, Newtown, and St. Inigo's, and those at the college were benefactors. A living endowment of tears, coerced benefactors of the college and the prep school. These men and women and children made it possible for us to be sitting here together today. We stand in their debt. We remember and honor their suffering. We are humbled and inspired by their strength and faith. And we pray as an institution for their forgiveness and that of their descendants. Monday, June the 25th, 1838, pre-dawn, White Marsh Farm, now Bowie, Maryland. Cornelius Neely Hawkins, 13, Austin, 13, David Queen, 14, and Anderson, 18, were probably stirring on an old blanket and a straw sack that covered several planks and acted as a bed in their respective cabins on that morning. Or perhaps because it was summer, they preferred sleeping on the dirt floor of the one and one half story single room cabin, feet pointed toward the open door and an old woolen blanket pulled over the head to guard against mosquitoes. They did not wear undershirts or shoes or stockings except in winter and when they, had, and when they were in church. And they had no change of linen or night shirts, two shirts, a pair of pants, one woolen jacket, a pair of breeches, a pair of stockings and new shoes each winter constituted their wardrobe. The nucleus of the enslaved community at White Marsh traced back to the slaves of James Carroll, a merchant and slave trader. In 1729, he had bequeathed 31 slaves and his property known as Carrollsburg, subsequently changed to White Marsh, to a Jesuit priest, George Thorold. Until 1715, Jesuits had owned few slaves relying on white indentured servants to farm their lands. As the 18th century progressed, however, the Jesuits, like so many other Maryland landowners, became dependent on the labor of enslaved persons. By the 1830s, the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus was the largest slave owning entity in the state. James Carroll, by the way, was an ancestor of Prep's founder, the Reverend John Carroll, the first Catholic Bishop and Archbishop in the United States. Having been baptized Catholic and having received some religious instruction from Jesuits, Cornelius, Austin, David and Anderson would have attended mass the previous day with their families and the rest of the farm slave community. There, they would have seen many of the women fingering their rosary beads. A Jesuit priest would have been their celebrant and he would have also been their slave master. Jesuits regarded slaves as dependent children easily led into error and in need of guidance from upright whites who they believed had a duty to keep them from immoral behavior through corporal punishment if necessary. On this Monday morning in 1838, as with all other mornings, Cornelius, Austin and David would have had to milk the cows and feed the horses before they themselves ate. Their diet consisted largely of salt pork, salt herring on Fridays and fast days, and cornmeal, with each family receiving two quarts of molasses each week to make the cornbread more palatable. Families were also allowed their own gardens in which they could raise vegetables, such as cabbage and sweet potatoes to augment their, mon their monotonous fare. The food situation had improved significantly since 1820 when inadequate supplies of food and inadequate shelter made life miserable for the enslaved on the farms. From 1806 to 1811, the income from St. Inigo's was earmarked for support of the college. In 1812, full control of St. Inigo's passed to the president of Georgetown College, a situation that lasted until 1820. The college thus bore responsibility for the poor conditions that plagued St. Inigo's and was characteristic of the other Jesuit farms. Inefficient management, inadequate food, harsh punishments, 
some priests had even whipped pregnant women. A report by Reverend Peter Kenny, a Jesuit sent by the superior of the Society of Jesus in Rome to inspect the missions, led to a shakeup in farm administrators, limitations placed on the use of corporal punishment, an absolute prohibition against priests whipping slaves, and increased allotments of food for the enslaved persons. Cornelius, Austin, and David would have expected to spend the rest of their day herding livestock or doing chores. The plantations produced tobacco as a cash crop in the 18th and early 19th century and raised animals. The farms also engaged in small time manufacturing of candles, shoes, horseshoes, and linen. At age 18, Anderson most likely had already joined the ranks of men in the fields, cultivating wheat and other cereal crops now that the soil could no longer support tobacco. None of them had received any formal education because as a later Jesuit explained, quote, they could do their work on the plantation just as well without it, end of quote. An ironic statement, given, that the, given the society's reputation as preeminent educators of young men. It's not clear when Cornelius, Austin, David, and Anderson first sensed trouble that morning. Perhaps their initial sense of trouble came from the unfamiliar and insistent braying of dogs in the distance or from the more proximate appearance of strangers approaching their cabins with leashed hounds. Whatever it was, from that point forward, Cornelius, Sam, David, and Anderson would experience a day such as they had never known before. Dawn, June 25th, prep students, Georgetown College. 25 miles to the southeast at Georgetown College, Joseph Johnson from New River, Louisiana, a student since September 11th, 1837 in the preparatory department of the college, rose in an open dormitory with the rest of his 115 classmates at 5 a.m. Joseph made his way to the water pump in the middle of the college yard to wash his face and hands, and then dressed himself in his summer uniform a black frock coat or jacket with white shirt and vest and white trousers. Each student was required to have two suits for daily wear. Also to have six shirts, six pairs of stockings, six pocket handkerchiefs, three pairs of shoes, a hat, a cloak or great coat and a silver spoon and fork marked with his initials. The clothing would be washed by enslaved women working in the washroom. Students in the preparatory department were often the sons of affluent government officials and wealthy plantation owners from the Deep South and the Maryland, Virginia, DC area. Joseph's uncle, for example, was a sugar planter and sitting member of the United States House of Representatives from Louisiana. He was also a former United States Senator and governor of that state. The 150 acre campus that Joseph and other students inhabited centered on a hilltop overlooking the Potomac River thus providing its students a healthier climate than the low-lying city of Washington, D.C. Once dressed, Joseph began a regimented day. His meals consisted of a breakfast of bread, no butter, and two bowls of coffee with milk. Dinner, eaten in silence while listening to a prescribed reading, featured veal or mutton with potatoes and seasonal vegetables. On Friday and Saturday, fish of some sort was served. A snack of bread in late afternoon and a supper of bread and tea at 7 p.m. followed that main dinner meal. Of course, Joseph could augment the simple but nutritious meal with cakes and candy sold at the college store. Joseph's classical curriculum, heavy in its emphasis on Greek and Latin, but also including ancient and American history, geography, mathematics, and French was demanding. But he and his compatriots also enjoyed handball games. You can see here the handball court, uh, handball games, excursions into the city, special dinners at Christmas, New Year's and the 4th of July, as well as days off from class for special feast days of the church. Then there was summer villa, 10 to 14 days of vacation at one of the Jesuit farms. Jesuit farm managers dreaded these visits as the students often ran wild 
pulling down limbs of trees and orchards, stealing fruit, breaking fences, and generally raising hell. Joseph and his friends were oblivious, privileged teenagers. Many had arrived at the college from the deep south with knives and guns. One Jesuit charged with disarming and controlling them described them as little bears and fierce young tigers with no idea of self-restraint, ungovernable and immensely imperious. Jesuit historian Joseph Durkin described Georgetown College in those years as having the composite air of a Southern plantation. In 1828, the Georgetown College catalog, you can see it on the screen, noted an annual charge of $5 to be paid by entering students for fuel and the service of slaves. And they use servants, uh, but that, that what they mean are slaves. The college owned, bought, sold, rented, and leased enslaved persons. Although only a handful, excuse me, although only a handful uh, were living on campus uh, by 1838. During his visits to the farms, Joseph may well have seen Cornelius, Sam, David, Anderson, or other teenage enslaved persons. But he and his fellow students probably took little notice of them, other than to make sport of them by, quote, parading their wisdom before the Negroes, end of quote, as one Jesuit scholastic put it. Although physically proximate to slaves on the farms, Joseph and his classmates inhabited a world apart from them, even as enslaved teenagers supported the students' world through their labor. Foodstuffs, meat, and produce from the farms, all products of the toil of slave labor, helped feed prep students who, till 1833, paid no tuition. They did pay room and board. In the 1830s, as Georgetown's financial woes mounted, income from the revived farms of that decade flowed into the Jesuit Maryland Province General Fund and out again as loans uh, to keep the college afloat. Joseph Johnson's world was an advantaged one. Presidents of the United States and other distinguished government figures visited his school's campus and attended award ceremonies and commencement exercises. President Andrew Jackson enrolled his ward and grandnephew, Andrew Jackson Hutchings, in the school in 1829. Life would be filled with opportunity for the prep students when they left the college, not so for their enslaved counterparts. Still Dawn, June 25th, White Marsh. Mullity, sale, and roundup. As it turned out on that June morning as Joseph dressed at the college, his uncle, Congressman Henry Johnson was standing at the entrance to the White Marsh Plantation, not very far from Cornelius, David, Sam, and Anderson. Johnson was accompanying the Reverend Thomas F. Mullady, the new provincial superior of the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus. In other words, the top Jesuit in the Maryland province. Mullady had concluded a deal with Johnson and Johnson's business partner, Jesse Beatty, to purchase 272 slaves on the Maryland Jesuit farms. Half of those slaves were under 20 years of age. 83 were under the age of 10. Johnson and Beatty, both sugar planters in Louisiana, had agreed to pay the Maryland province $113,000. Now, in today's equivalency, and these equivalencies are difficult, but it's like between 3.3 .3 and $7 million. 25,000 in a down payment with a balance paid in yearly installments at 6% interest. Milady, who had been president of Georgetown College for the previous nine years, was the burly son of Irish immigrants, proud, strong-willed, and quick-tempered. As a young scholastic teaching at, at Georgetown, he had handled an unruly student by tossing him out of a first-floor classroom window. He was used to getting his own way. A born leader, talented and energetic. Mullady and, Mullady, sorry, and five other promising Jesuit scholastics, and scholastics were, were Jesuits in training for the priesthood. Uh, they, they had been sent to complete their studies in Rome. They were the best and the brightest and were expected to return to lead the Maryland province. In 1829, less than a year after his return to the United States, the 35-year-old Milady was named president of Georgetown College. 
During his nine-year tenure, he embarked on an ambitious building campaign that added two new buildings and other improvements to the, to the campus. Mulady's ambitious products, however, left the college deeply in debt. Nevertheless, despite his money management shortcomings, Mulady was named Provincial Superior of the Maryland Province in January 1838, changing places with Father McSherry, who then became president of the college. As provincial, Milady was determined to carry out a plan that he, McSherry, and others of the best and brightest had been advocating for several years. The sale of all but the elderly and infirm slaves on the farms owned by the province. In a letter to the reluctant and skeptical Superior General of the Society of Jesus in Rome, Jan Rutan, Milady put the case starkly. It was impossible, the lady insisted, to maintain both the farms and the college. He succeeded in convincing Rutan to approve the mass sale of slaves as a way of strengthening Jesuit educational institutions in urban areas where the Catholic population was booming. The future lay there, Milady argued. Rutan finally assented, but insisted on several conditions. Husbands and wives could not be separated and all reasonable attempts had to be made to keep children with their parents. The new owner or owners would have to recognize and assist the right of the slaves to freely practice their Catholicism and above all, provide the enslaved with access to a priest. The money from the sale could not be used to retire debt, but instead had to be invested to support the education of Jesuits in training. Milady agreed to the terms, but as was said earlier, Milady usually managed to get what he wanted in the way that he wanted. Soon after concluding the sale of the 272 to Johnson and Beatty, Milady moved quickly to personally direct the roundup of the first group of 51 slaves. The slaves were drawn from the White Marsh and St. Indigo's farms. According to an 1838 census of slaves on the farms drawn up for Milady, St. Inigo's was home to 91 enslaved persons, White Marsh to 90, St. Thomas to 47, and Newtown to 44. Recent re research, however, indicates that the number of enslaved persons living on the four farms was actually about 314. Milady and Johnson arrived at White Marsh with hired sheriffs and constables and their dogs. They appeared without prior notice to the Jesuit farm manager because Milady knew that he, like his counterpart at St. Indigo's and the other Jesuit owned farms, strongly opposed what Milady attempt, uh, excuse me, intended to do. Milady feared that the managers might disperse or hide the slaves if they had forewarning. In his hand, Milady held the census that listed the names of each of the slaves on the farms, along with age, gender, and color. The census also indicated family units. The scene at White Marsh would be repeated within a week or so at St. Inigo's and then again in November at all four of the farms. Father Thomas Lilly wrote, they were dragged off by force. The danger to their souls is certain. Father Peter Habermans, shown here at Newtown, described how one old woman sought his blessing on her knees and begged to know what she had done to deserve what was happening. All the others came to me seeking rosaries, Havermans wrote. He marveled at the heroic courage and Christian resignation of the slaves. Cornelius Hawkins likely saw the scene at White Marsh as David Queen, Sam and Anderson were marched off with their families. Doubtless he was relieved that he and his family had been spared this first deportation, but he undoubtedly recognized that his family's time would come soon November, as it turned out. Journeys, 1838 to 1843. The receipts for the cost of transporting the slaves, feeding and housing them as they were taken to Alexandria, Virginia, indicate that some were marched over land while others at a greater distance from Alexandria were brought by boat. 
slaves from White Marsh were probably marched overland to Washington and then over a bridge and down to Alexandria. Slaves from St. Thomas were apparently marched through Piscataway and then to the shore opposite Alexandria uh, from which they were ferried to the slave ship Uncas. Slaves from St. Inigo's were probably brought by ship to the Alexandria Harbor uh, as were those uh, from Newtown. Some may have been confined in Capehart's jail, a notorious detention center located on Duke Street in Alexandria. It housed slaves as they awaited embarkation on ships bound for Southern ports, most notably New Orleans, or for overland marches to slave marts in the Mississippi Valley. Until 1835-36, the jail had been part of the headquarters of the firm of Franklin and Armfield, the largest slave dealers in the United States. The enslaved were living one of their worst nightmares, that of being sold to the Deep South, a process that was gathering momentum in the 1830s as hundreds of thousands of slaves in the Upper South were sent down to the more profitable cotton and sugar fields of Mississippi, Texas, and Louisiana. The planting, cutting, hauling, scraping, and boiling of sugarcane was particularly backbreaking. The sorrow and anxiety that the slaves must have felt facing an unknown fate in a land they dreaded must have seemed overwhelming. David Queen's father attempted escape, as did some others. But for most of them, it was to no avail. While Joseph Johnson and other preparatory students traveled to one of the farms for summer vacation, Anderson, David Queen, and Sam from White Marsh, and Abraham and Robert from St. Inigo's joined 46 other slaves gathered from two farms. They found themselves crammed for a month long voyage aboard the slave ship Uncas, bound for Terrebonne Parish in Southern Louisiana via New Orleans. A slave trader, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, bound for New Orleans, okay? And this is, uh, these are the routes. So, so the, the, uh, the Maryland slaves are gonna be taking taken this way, right, around and to New Orleans. Uh, one of the uh, uh, slave traders described uh, the ship, uh, the Uncas, the hold divided into two departments. The after hold will carry about 80 women and the other about 100 men. On either side of the hold were platforms running the whole length, one raised a few inches above the floor and the other halfway up the deck. They were about five or six feet wide. On these, David and the others lay as closely as they could, okay, at, at, as closely as they could, stowed away as they were. Okay. From New Orleans, or excuse me, arriving in New Orleans, the 51 were loaded into shallow draft boats and commenced the last leg of the 50 mile journey to Joseph Beatty's plantation in Terrebonne. You can see the, uh, the red line is showing you uh, the direction there. The well, Terrebonne was located about 60 miles southwest of New Orleans. A story passed down through the descendants of Mary Queen, one of the slaves on the boat, told of a young mother sitting at the back of the boat with an infant in her arms. An alligator stalked the rear of that boat for the entire trip. The second and third waves of deportations from Maryland took place in November and early December of 1838. One of the bills presented to Father Milady for the movement of slaves to Alexandria read starkly, supper, lading, lading, sorry, lading and breakfast for horses and servants, right? Servants, of course, being people, all right? Uh, the the, uh, the Maryland uh, enslaved persons. In early December, uh, Mr. Mullen presented a bill to Milady for $10, the cost of taking one slave probably an apprehended runaway, to Alexandria and depositing him in Cape Hearts jail prior to boarding one of the ships. Upon arrival in Alexandria, the slave and slave persons, including Cornelius Hawkins and his immediate family, were placed aboard the Catherine Jackson and another ship not yet identified and sent to New Orleans. Once the two ships reached New Orleans, the enslaved were offloaded and then taken by small boats 100 miles up the Mississippi River, Cornelius and his family went to Joseph Beatty's plantation in Iberville Parish, 
Others were taken uh, to Henry Johnson's plantation that abutted Beatty's and lay just across the Ascension Parish line. Johnson and Beatty had paid 25,000 upfront for the 272 slaves and arranged to pay the balance of the 113,000 $113, plus interest over time. Milady took the initial $25,000 payment and in turn loaned 24,000 of it to the college. The college was now able to pay down most of its debt to outside creditors, thus regaining its financial stability. The sale had saved the college and its preparatory department. A brighter future for the college and its students came at the expense of the enslaved persons owned by the Society of Jesus. Over the next several years, at least two more groups of slaves from the Jesuit Maryland farms were sent to Louisiana. But while the documents speak of 272 slaves being purchased, in fact, the lives of 300, uh, lives and families of 314 individuals were radically impacted by the sale. In addition, only 215 were ever sent to Louisiana. The rest, 99, because one name is suspected to have been duplicated uh, on the uh, original census, uh, remained back in Maryland. The term GU-272 was coined at Georgetown University and became a catchphrase for all of those enslaved persons impacted by the 1838 sale. The 99 persons who never left Maryland included the aged and the infirm, but also able-bodied individuals who were not sent to Louisiana in order to avoid severing marriages. Others ran away from the farms or were, or were sold to parts unknown. Some stayed in Maryland because Jesuit managers had urged them to hide during the roundups and then welcomed them back to the farm once things quieted down. Such was the case of Louisa Mahoney Mason of St. Indigo's Farm, who at the urging of the Reverend Joseph Carberry had hidden with her mother and her other family members in the woods for a week in 1838 in order to avoid the roundup. They then returned to St. Indigo's where Father Carberry welcomed them back with open arms. He then proceeded to purchase Louisa, Louisa from Henry Johnson. Louisa and her family were the last slaves emancipated by the Jesuits in 1864 during the Civil War. She remained with her family at St. Inigo's until her death at the age of 97 in 1909. She died revered for her deep spirituality by both black Catholics and the many Jesuits who knew her. Her descendants continued to work with Jesuits into the 21st century and her great, great, great grandson, August Matthews, was a member of PrEP's class of, of not 2010, of 2020 last year. Sorry for the, uh, uh, for the, for the typo, okay? Aftermath. Milady's action in lending the money to Georgetown College violated Rutan's stipulation that no money could be used to pay down debt but had to be invested in order to generate income to support the work of the Maryland province. No one does this sort of thing, Haverman thundered in a letter to the Superior General, except evil persons such as slave traders who care about nothing but money or those who by necessity are so pressed by debts, they're forced to such a, such a sale. I tell you truly, this will be a tragic and disgraceful affair. His words prove prophetic because the sale shocked and upset many Catholics in Maryland, including the Archbishop of Baltimore. In response to that reaction and to Milady's violation of the condition that he had laid down for the sale, Rutan pressured Milady to resign as provincial and called him to Rome. Milady stayed in Europe for three years before returning to the United States. Haverman's prediction of tragedy and disgrace also proved prophetic in that the new owners failed in their promises to provide for the religious care of the Maryland slaves. Rutan had insisted that the sales stipulate that the slaves would have the benefit of exercising their religion and the assistance of a priest. As with other of Rutan's conditions, however, this one, despite a seemingly good beginning at Johnson's plantation, came to naught. Johnson suffered financial reverses, and 10 years after the sale, Jesuit priest James Oliver Vandeveld reported to the Reverend Ignatius Brock Brockard, the provincial superior of the Maryland province, that the enslaved persons from Maryland, quote, are now found destitute of nearly all religious support, end of quote. 
Distance prevented them from reaching a Catholic church in Donaldsonville, 12 miles away. And Johnson, who had promised to build a church, no longer had the means to do so. According to Vandeveld, many of the slaves had not seen a priest in years. This same situation also held true for the group of Maryland slaves in Terrebonne Parish in Southern Louisiana. When Beatty died in 1851, most of the slaves on his plantation in Terrebonne were scattered, uh, were scattered through sale with families broken up. But the slaves sent to Louisiana were not entirely forgotten. An entry in the Maryland Province Day and Cash Book in 1860 shows that the province spent $29.61 for medals, crosses, rosaries, and books for the colored people sold in Louisiana. A later entry in a Maryland Province financial ledger in the early 20th century claims that Louisa Mahoney Mason, who, whom we saw a few slides before, maintain contact, how it's not yet clear, with some of the Maryland exiles sent to Louisiana. The legacy of the descendants. The legacy of the descendants. The story of the 272 is one of tragic betrayal and exploitation and a sad, shameful chapter in Prep's history. But the heritage of the 70 to 272 the lives they lived in exile, the faith they kept, and the families and communities they built and maintained provide a redemptive counterpoint to this story. This is a photo of Frank Campbell taken in 1906 when he was about 92 or 93 years old. The young girls in the photos are his granddaughters, one of whom, Mary Jane Campbell, was born around 1904. It's one of only two photos we have of those sold to Louisiana. Remember, Louisa, uh, Louisa Mason, whom you've already seen, uh, she remained in Maryland. She you know, technically she was sold and then, you know, then she was rebought by the Jesuits. Uh, Frank Campbell uh, went, went, ended up in, in Louisiana. Frank was born in 1820 at St. Inigo's and was 20 years old uh, at the time of his sale to Jesse, B, Jesse Beatty and his transportation. Uh, there in 1850, he married Mary Jane Mahoney, who also came from St. Inigo's. They wed, however, without benefit of a priest. Uh, later that same year, their son Nathan was born. Uh, on January 20th, 1851, Jesse Beatty having died, most of his slaves were sold, but Frank and his wife and their son, uh, although being sold, were at least uh, sold together. Um, between 1858 and the early 60s, Frank and Mary Jane had three other children whom they raised as Catholics. They had kept the faith despite what had been done to them. On February 1, 1881, Frank and Mary Jane traveled 20 miles to St. Francis de Sales Catholic Church to secure a marriage license and to have their marriage of 31 years officially recorded uh, and blessed uh, by a priest. Sacramental and civil documents attesting to personhood and family were precious to those who had formerly been enslaved. Frank Campbell never learned to read or write and became a sharecropper all direct legacies of slavery. But in 1882, at the age of 62, he purchased a plot of land in a district near Huma at a total price of $50. Frank and his wife, who lived well into their 90s, just a few miles from the former Beatty Plantation at last owned property of their own. They passed on their faith and their hopes for a better future to their children and subsequent generations. Melisande Short Cologne, Melly. We followed David Queen and White Marsh to Alexandria, New Orleans, and finally to Terrebonne Parish. In September of 2017, the story of David and the Queen family came full circle in the person of 63 year old Melisande Short Cologne. A descendant of David Queen's cousin, Mary Queen, and her husband, Abraham Mahoney, Ms. Short Cologne was granted legacy status as an applicant to the university. Uh, excuse me, sorry. This meant that she and any other descendant of persons enslaved by the Maryland Jesuits would be considered for admission to the university from the pool of applicants recognized as having a special familial tie to the university. This was one of a number of steps that Georgetown University took as part of its efforts to acknowledge its past connection to slavery and the sale of the 272 and to reconcile with the descendants. And, and, and uh, recently, 
uh, Georgetown University uh, students uh, this last year overwhelmingly approved a voluntary extra fee of $27.02 per student each semester to be used as reparations for the descendants of the 272. Historians only uh, get answers to the questions that they ask. And one of the questions that had gone unasked by scholars who had studied Jesuit slavery was what happened to the descendants? Uh, there was a kind of a myth that grew up that most of them had died of disease uh, when they arrived in Louisiana. But Richard Cellini, a uh, Georgetown graduate, a, a very successful businessman in Boston, a uh, tech, uh, tech guy, uh, but also a lawyer uh, and a real uh, history buff, uh, he asked the question, well, he, he expressed skepticism and then explored the question, what happened? And thanks to the memory project that he founded, uh, more than 8,000 of the approximately 15 to 20,000 descendants that are probably living today have been identified. I am bringing us back home, Ms. Short Cologne said of her decision to attend Georgetown University. And she has become an outspoken advocate on campus and throughout the nation on behalf of the descendants. Uh, in April of 2019, she spearheaded the student referendum to establish that semester fee of 2720 uh, for, uh, for reparations. Completing another part of that circle, Ms. Short Cologne visited PrEP on February 23rd, 2018, speaking to a whole school assembly and answering student questions, meeting with the editors of the Little Hoya newspaper, touring the campus, having lunch with members of the Black Student Association. She also uh, adv has advised PrEP on the design of the memorial uh, to the enslaved that will be part of the new building project on, on the campus. And last, last thing, a crack in time. Four summers ago, I traveled to Maringuin to meet with Cornelius's great, great granddaughter, Maxine Crump, who graciously took me on a tour of the area in 100 degree heat. She had only recently learned the name of her great great grandfather as a result of a call from Richard Cellini. He told her that she was descended from Cornelius Hawkins. We ended our tour with a visit to Cornelius's grave at Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Cemetery, yet another Marian connection in our story. Uh, this is uh, Maxine Crump, and uh, these are pictures of her, of her family. Uh, the uh, headstone uh, and the uh, that, that that had been not that, that had been that had fallen over, and uh, they she and her and uh, another gene and a genealogist found it, and they and then her family uh, you know put it back uh, in its rightful place etc., uh, and uh, the headstone of Cornelius. Now I'd like you to notice something about that headstone. You can see up here, <clears throat> you can see uh, that the headstone has a crack in it, or you'll see it in the next picture much better. The headstone had been broken and separated uh, from its base, <clears throat> but it had been found by Maxine and Judy Riffle, uh, a genealogist associated with the Georgetown Memory Project. Ms. Crump's brothers took the broken headstone, unearthed and removed the base that had re remained in the ground in front of the grave marker, and then laid both the headstone and the base together over the marker. And this is what it looks like. As I gazed down at the reunited headstone and, and the, base mark, the base marking the last repose of a once young boy who had endured and prevailed against so much, I was struck by the vivid crack that remains between the two pieces of the gravestone. The scene suggested multiple meanings, the forced separation of the enslaved persons from their homes, the shattered connection between the enslaved persons and the Jesuits, the breach of faith involved in the society's actions, and the corresponding debt owed to those wronged, the separate worlds inhabited by the prep students and the enslaved, the severing of historical and familial memory, the wounds inflicted by slavery on the enslaved, both on Jesuit farms and at the college, the racial fault line in contemporary American society. But I also thought of the words that Richard Cellini never tires of repeating. Families make shared memories, but shared memories also make families. From that perspective, the two parts of the headstone now rejoined over Neely Hawkins' grave also potentially embodied more hopeful meanings. Recovery of memories, reunion of families, reconnection with and reconciliation between Georgetown University, Georgetown Prep, and the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus and the descendants of the 272. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
people whose labor had ensured the existence of the three institutions. The crack is still there, a reminder of things past that continue to separate. And the connection of the two parts does indeed appear tenuous, in need of a stronger bond. But the two pieces are resting together, waiting to be fully one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oakes. I, uh, incredibly complex, entangled, powerful story. Um, I admire you being able to keep your composure for the presentation, frankly. It, it's, um, very, it's quite emotional. Um, I'm sure that some questions will come in. Um, in the meantime, I, I would be curious about the reaction of uh, PrEP students. As, and, and actually, before you do that, would you again give the names of the students who wrote the presentation? Uh, I, I wrote the presentation. Uh, you did. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, there, there were, you know, I, we, I discussed with students, et cetera, et cetera. They, they went over things, et cetera. Uh, but I ended up, you know, writing it uh, really because of time, a uh, time constraint to get, get it done. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. So as far as the reaction of students. Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I, th this is broken into uh, three different 20 minute segments. So the students don't, don't sit for an hour, you know, listening to this, this, this is, you know, uh, calibrated to like their attention span. Uh, so uh, the, the, the reaction was very positive. We had, after each of the talks, we had uh, the whole school broke down into uh, uh, student and uh, student groups and uh, with a teacher. Uh, and uh, there, were, there, were, there were questions that accompanied uh, each segment uh, that the students uh, reflected about uh, questions, you know, uh, asking about their reactions to, you know, how did you feel when, da 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 da. What th what struck you most? Uh, what does this uh, 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 what does this say to you? What, what what do we do with this? You know, what 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 should prep do with this? What should we do with it as individuals? Those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, and then uh, we had, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, we had uh, uh, we had the two talks uh, again by Rachel Swarns and and by um, uh, Anne Amelie. And uh, she, and she was and, and both of those were very good. And then we had we did the same thing, broke down groups, uh, etc. So it was a positive reaction. It also there was a student run a, a discussion on race at, at prep and in our society, uh, totally student run uh, that occurred uh, also as part of all this program. Uh, so a, a positive uh, reaction. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, I mean, you get you, you got a range of things like you know, look, we didn't you know from uh, I had nothing to do with this. So, I mean, I, I feel badly for them, but I, I, I feel like I, I'm, you know, are you putting a guilt trip on me? Uh, or, or uh, you know, or, 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 you know, boy, you know, that, that you know, a reaction of, you know, I, I feel really, I feel like I have a responsibility to do certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, so, but very, but generally positive, very positive, very positive. And, and we did this program for the parents also and for our alumni. Uh, and so uh, we tried to be as broadly based uh, as we could with the presentations. One question is, uh, were the enslaved persons living on Je Jesuit properties in Maryland treated, in, treated better in general than they would have been if they had lived on other Maryland plantations or plantations in the Mid-South? I guess it gets at sort of the difference between the Deep South and the Upper South. And, right, right, and and, and, and what also, generalizations might be able to be made or not? Right, uh, and and also another uh, another uh, uh, disparity: the uh, slaves held by religious and, and slaves held by by lay people. Um, so uh, let me put it this way: there certainly was a uh, a uh, a saying uh, that the pre slaves lived better uh, that circulated among uh, Maryland Catholics and. And, uh, and others. Uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, it, it's hard to tell. When you look at their conditions, uh, were they as severe a, a, as in the Deep South? Uh, no. Slavery in, in Maryland tended not to be as brutal uh, as, as slavery in the Deep South. Although if you had a brutal master, I mean, that's, that's the key to it, right? Uh, but did, did the slaves have uh, very bad conditions? 
in that period that I referred to in the talk, uh, in this, especially in the early 19th, you know, that first decade or first two decades of the 19th century. I mean, it, they were really, you know, it was it was severe. I mean, people were being whipped and, and you know, uh, uh, not very much food and, and, you know, poor food and all that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so it's hard to it's hard to generalize on that on that score. They had there was a, a kind of a meme, meme meme going around, you know, that yeah, priest priest slaves are treated better, but you heard me describe their conditions, and you know, so uh, you know, slavery was was always a bad a bad thing. Um, another question is um, and specifically about uh, Georgetown Prep. You sure. spoke you spoke to some of this. Um, what concrete actions? Um, is Georgetown Prep taking for reconciliation? Uh, I'll give you that question first, and there's another part of it. Sure. So, uh, so there are uh, a number of things that, that that we have been doing each year. We have a program now each year to uh, ed educate our students about this, and and it always is. And 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 so, and what is the actions that we should take? So, so some of the things that that um, we we have done here is that uh, descendants. Uh, who apply to Georgetown Prep um, will have, you know, are given special consideration. So uh, August Matthews, who was a member of our senior class last year, uh, was uh, the first of the uh, the first descendant, right, uh, to to come in uh, to to Prep, a known descendant, right. Uh, and um, we're there's, as I said, we're going to be uh, erecting a memorial uh, to uh, the to the uh, enslaved persons. Uh, there's also uh, in our chapel a uh, Permanent a uh, blow up of the of the um, of the 1838 census, uh, and that is uh, placed in the the Marion Chapel. Uh, there, the uh, the uh, Maryland slaves had a, a real devotion to Mary. Uh, the Rosary was a really big thing, uh, and so uh, that is in that's a very prominent place, and and uh, it, it's 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 there to to mark that. Um, our students are required uh, to. Uh, do do service uh, every year, uh, and um, and uh, so so many of them uh, are involved in in projects like uh, working at uh, the Washington Jesuit Academy, which is a, a, a junior high uh, in uh, D.C. that's run by the Jesuits. Uh, so in, in you know working in in, in the, those kinds of settings, uh, which and again you know trying to say all right the the, the whole the racial scene has has. Has, is, a, is a legacy of the of slavery, and so how can we how can we work in that regard uh, to, um, to to try to heal this? Uh, so uh, those are those are some things that we've been doing to try to institutionalize the memory of it, uh, to honor the uh, honor the memory of the 272, to involve our students in actions that are uh, focused on uh, uh, social justice and uh, and to uh, yeah and and, I, and and the memorial and to memorialize them. Thank you. Um Not really related to that, but the other part of that question, um, not directly related, but just a bit about Georgetown Prep's history. Um, when did Georgetown Prep become desegregated? Ah, uh, in 1953. And, so before uh, the Brown decision. Yes, it was the it was the September before the Brown decision, uh, and uh, uh, Anthony Pierce who was a, uh, a young man from uh, the district, he entered as a seventh grader, uh, Prep had a seventh and eighth grade until uh, 1967, I believe. Uh, and uh, so he entered as a seventh grader and he, re and he left Prep at the end of his junior year. Uh, and he finished uh, at uh, high school in, uh, in Washington, DC, uh, and then uh, went on to, uh, a college, and he's now a he. He was an executive for um, uh, a, a cruise line, uh, etc. Um, his story. I, I wrote his story, and uh, this was a while ago, probably oh my gosh, fifteen years ago. No more than that. Uh, and uh, he left. It's interesting. He he, he was uh, he left because of social reasons. Uh, this was a period of time when the. Uh, country clubs were segregated, et cetera. And at, at that time, our student body uh, had a profile that was a, a pretty country club. And uh, <laughs> and so they were, they, they were, they were, yeah, and I know you'll say, well, well, no one thinks that today either. Uh, but um, 
uh, but but they had a uh, he they would have parties and and he couldn't go to them because they were segregated and so his relations the you know and Tony uh, Tony Pierce and I are, are are good friends we we he came back to prep was honored at uh, the commencement in 2000 and what was it uh, 2005 uh, and got his got a, a the honor an honorary diploma etc and gave an address to the students uh, he, he, you know uh, he's really uh, it's it's interesting you know he he said he, it it was that social thing uh, but that he never encountered any kind of of uh, hostility or any kind of uh, you know he had warm he had warm feelings for a lot of the people that he this his fellow students but he felt socially he couldn't be a full member and so um, and so he left and then. Uh, in 1960, excuse me, in 1962, uh, Steve Davis was our first African American graduate, uh, and so, um, so yeah, so so prep prep actually integrated before uh, most schools in um, Montgomery County, uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, in the in our in our league, the uh, IAC and all that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there we go. Nineteen fifty. Yeah, thank you. That's that's interesting. Um, this you may not know um, specifically, but this question is from a noted historian in Prince George's County, um, and so wondering about um, some of the properties there. Do you know whether the individual Jesuit farms um, are making special observations regarding descendants of the slaves taken from particular properties, especially probably the one in Bowie? Yeah, uh, the White Marsh. The White Marsh property was sold to the state of Maryland, or, or most of it, uh, part the original part of that plantation is still, the, it's the church, it's a replica of the church and all that is, is part of Sacred Heart Parish in Bowie. Uh, but the, the when those lands were sold, uh, a fund was set up called the Carroll Scholarships. And so uh, from part of that money was the, the, Carroll, the Carroll Scholarships. And so that money was to go to uh, not not descendants, and I'll, I'll tell you why not descendants in just one second. Didn't specify descendants, but it would go to African American uh, uh, students uh, for, uh, who are applying to you know entering uh, Jesuit schools of the province. Uh, the whole question of identifying uh, the, the descendants, it, you know, just uh, it was just very recent. Uh, and what what happened was the, the, these descendants could be identified because the Jesuits did something that most slaveholders did not do. They they gave slaves last names now on the on the on the sale bill of sale and all that just first names are used but on the manifest the ship manifests uh you know transporting them there are the last names right so isaac i know notice i would say cornelius hawkins but some i would just say you know the the first name because i didn't hadn't written down but there was a last name connected now this is unbelievable for tracing right it's so unbelievably important because that's the whole problem with tracing slave families and descendants. And that is that you just only have first names and then you lose it. Indeed. Yeah, so this is an important thing uh, for, the, for, for identifying. And that's why PrEP and Georgetown University, I think, feel a speci an especial uh, uh, obligation because it is possible to identify particular people wronged in this situation. And so I'll, I'll just put it like this. It's hard for people to dodge that there's responsibility when you can attach a name and a face. Mm -hmm. And you can give a specific example of how his sale benefited the institution and ultimately everybody sitting in the audience that was listening to, to my talk to who were prep students, uh, including okay. black students. You know, uh, which is the irony is one of, one of, the, one of, the, one of, one of them pointed out, but, but yeah. Probably two other quick points related sure. to that is um, having better documentation. Um, you and Georgetown Prep and Georgetown University have been able to trace where the descendants are today. Generally speaking, ha have um, have descendants returned to this area, or as, you know, again, it's a generalization, but yeah. in general, uh, I mean, they're scattered all over the United States, right? right. I mean, uh, but. Uh, but there's still a big concentration in Maringouin, Louisiana, in that area, and the, in Terrebonne. It's funny because, oh, it's not funny. I mean, it's ironic. Given the tale about uh, the, the slaves perishing, uh, 
genealogists in Louisiana knew about the large numbers of slaves who had come from Maryland, and in fact, referred to them as Jesuit slaves, uh, you know, for decades. Uh, and uh, and so so this is a story that kind of was under the you know just it was just kind of under the the uh, the uh, or out of sight, uh, but uh, but yeah, genealogists were were very aware that there was all this linkage. Now, what happened though in many you know in Maringouin, for example, many people lost lost uh, you know the story was lost. Uh, it, it it seems it seems to be that um, parents would not tell their kids the story because in part to protect their Catholicism. They didn't want them to know that priests had been involved in the sale mm. or they would tell one. Uh, and this is, I mean, you, you know, people have been identified who have been discussing this with descendants and all this, uh, or they would tell one person in the family, the oldest kid. And then they were, they, they had the story, but they weren't supposed to, you know, uh, spread it around until, you know, it was time for them to pass on the story. So a lot of the historical connections and linkages were just broken. People didn't know uh, what uh, uh, the, the person, Maxine Crump, that I met, she said her mother always said to her, I don't want you dating any, any guys from Maringuin. We're all related. I want you to date guys from out, outside the town, uh, from, you know, away from the town. Uh, so there was there was this understanding that they were all kind of interconnected, but but that whole Maryland connection was lost for an awful lot of them. And this is probably a good one to end on. Um, do you plan to write a book about this story or, or in other forms? Uh, the questioner says it's quite fa fascinating and needs to be told to a wider audience indeed. Well, I was I was lucky enough. I had used the, the Georgetown University archives um, in writing Two other books uh, that I did on on um, on African Americans and, and the church and Civil War and all this kind of stuff. So I was familiar, more familiar. I was familiar with the archives, but I was able. I was one of the first people al allowed to go in and look at the financial records of the Maryland province. And that sounds really boring, but I tell you what, the financial records were unbelievably informative. But no, I'm not going to be writing a book about this because. There's a young woman at Georgetown who is doing her doctoral dissertation on this, and she's quite good. Rachel Swarns is also doing a book on this, and there are other a couple of other uh, people who are doing books. So that's that's going to be a that's going to be a project for someone else. So, although it's 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 really I've been really fascinated by it and 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 all, but uh, but yeah, that's but there are books being written. There are uh, in process. Yeah, I, I can imagine, and indeed, Georgetown University is really been in the forefront on on the research of this and and i imagine you and uh, prep generally have been very much in coordination with georgetown university yes yeah. um we thank you tremendously for this um presentation gives a lot of food for thought um and uh, uh appreciation to uh, georgetown prep itself for sponsoring and for everyone attending today, just a reminder that the uh, closing performance, a little lighter, at 3.30, musician Jake Blount. And again, many, many thanks from all of us at Montgomery History, and uh, have uh, hope to see uh, many of you for the, uh, see in, in, in um, quotation marks, see virtually, for the uh, musical pr presentation about half an hour from now. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.